let's continue on with the story of the bourgeois revolution in textile technology. All right. As I was mentioning, um, James Hargraves, uh, Parsley Peel, and John Kay, this new John Kay, uh, these guys are going to be very important for our story. Okay, and here's John Hargraves. Uh, he invents the spinning jenny. Okay, and this is quite a revolutionary uh, invention. The, the flying shuttle was the first thing that really flies, pun intended. Uh, but um, the spinning jenny is the second thing that really takes off. The spinning jenny allows a single person to spin eight spools of yarn simultaneously. And uh, in that video that I pointed to you before, you can see how it's a, it's a, it's a tedious process to just spin one spool of thread with a spinning wheel. Um, this invention allows one person to do eight spools simultaneously and maybe even get um, a quality of yarn, uh, maybe that's not of the highest quality, but consistently of a good quality. Okay, so. You know, there's, there's all these trade-offs. Uh, uh, there is some indication that maybe the, the yarn from the spinning jenny wasn't sufficient for all applications uh, for the warp of the fabric, that it could be used for the weft, sending on the shuttle, you know, the flying shuttle back was for, good for that part, but not for the warp. Uh, because the warp needs to be a little stronger because of all the re repeated stress that it goes under uh, during the looming process. Uh, but nonetheless, this is a huge breakthrough because this just, this is a huge dramatic improvement in the, um, in the quantity that a single person could make of yarn in a day. Uh, maybe I would say at least double, but maybe three times or four times or maybe more. Um, so this helps quite a bit to help that supply problem. Remember that once the flying shuttle comes into play, then demand for yarn goes up, uh, the supply of yarn is low, and the price of yarn is very high. And this is a way of filling that gap and, and seems to do so uh, pretty effectively. Now, um, the spinning jenny is just a device that's like a desk sized device. And It's not a desktop device. It's like the size of the desk. Um, but it is something that you could have in a home and continue and use in a cottage industry burger uh, style production process. And, and, uh, and so those who could afford them uh, would certainly buy them because this could turn around your business uh, quite dramatically. Uh, a parsley peel is one of these who adopt this early, okay, and, and begins to buy some of these uh, devices. And of course, he's buddies with Hargraves, so uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and not too long afterwards, there's Jenny breaking riots. So some of the other uh, traditional yarn producers um, spinning on spinning wheels are, you know, coming to Hargrave's home and to Peel's workshop and breaking their spinning jenny machines. Uh, 
um, because they don't want the competition. It's just to them, it appears to be unfair competition. And there may be a quality issue. And so this is one thing that's running throughout is the traditional manufacturers, obviously they're doing it in the traditional way. So they're producing what has always been the standard. You come along with the spinning Jenny, okay, you can make a lot more of it, but is it the same thing? And if you're selling this on the wholesale market and your buyers can't tell the difference, then it's like forcing you to make a lower quality product. Um, and, and so there's a, it, it isn't purely what we would think of as an economic issue. It is an economic issue, but that's a political economic issue. But um, there is this moral and even aesthetic aspect to it that is involved with quality. You know, and, and of course we run into this all the time. I mean, you can make a, a, uh, uh, a Nissan Celica or Toyota Celica or whatever it is, you know, some very low wind car and you can make a lot of them, but it's not the greatest car in the world. It's, you know, and, and so, and if people can't tell the difference, you know, then it becomes problematic. And of course we have this issue with like, uh, I don't know, like sports car or let's say like a BMW, you know, you have a $65,000 BMW, that's a great car. Um, but then BMW feels compelled to make a $35,000 BMW. Uh, but the $35,000 BMW is not like a real BMW or, you know, pick your brand or do whatever it is. Um, so, uh, but if the consumer can't tell the difference, then, you know, what's the point of making the higher quality product? Um, you're gonna have a niche market for that, but the broad market now is moving to a lower quality product. Okay, so this is always kind of an issue throughout the uh, bourgeois industrial um, revolution. And people get mad about it, you know, they're it, it, not just for, monetary reasons but for reasons of value you know and cultural value issues um okay so it's so when we think about this it isn't just that people are getting angry because of money issues they're getting issues they're getting angry because of cultural issues and the cultural disruption that's taking place and um and and, and then uh, apart from just losing money on a particular day, people are becoming unemployed, getting thrown out of their homes, being thrown into debtor's prison, you know, so I mean, and that makes people angry too. <clears throat> All right, so then uh, Peel goes on to expand into to various towns uh, after this, and um, and and so uh, he's doing a very good business. Uh, he has his investor, Yates, who, um, you know, he has as a backup, which a lot of people don't have. So that, that ability to secure a, a financial backer is really crucial here. But then Peel is the guy that just rolls with the punches and keeps working at it even when he's set back by people like breaking into a shop and destroying all of his machinery, he just picks up and gets right back to it. All right, Art writes, um, we saw that he was experimenting back here um, with a carding machine. Uh, and he and Kay, this is uh, this John Kay, okay. Uh, invent the spinning frame. Um, now the spinning frame is where the Paul Wyatt roller and bobbin flyer system uh, come into play. Um, somehow 
art right and K uh, perfect that to some degree. And the the yarn that they're producing is actually stronger than what the spinning Jenny um, produces. And that's, this is where I'm getting that quality issue from. Um, and now this is only one spindle and because of the rollers, which are very heavy rollers and the whole contraption, this is something that requires a lot of mechanical force. So there's a lot of work uh, in terms of like Newtonian physics that's taking place here. So it's powered by two horses. So this is not something that you can set up in your living room in a cottage industry sort of situation. Um, this is a, a big contraption uh, and you have to have two horses. You gotta, you know, run those horses and maintain those horses. So this is a, a, a bit of expensive sort of uh, overhead involved here. Um, Art, now, Artright, Art, Artright uh, patents this system without the knowledge of K and doesn't put K on the paperwork. And so uh, K ultimately believes that Artright is stealing the intellectual property from him and they start, he starts to file lawsuits and Artright fights him off. And then also, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, way back. Mm -hmm. Hi, where is his name? Um, oh, I think I mentioned it in here. Oh, including high, uh, highs. So, this is the guy that K had been uh, experimenting with. He get he jumps in on the game too, um, and uh, is part of these legal disputes over this patent. Um, Arkwright fights them off fairly successfully and um, and continues moving on. Um, and and that may just be because. He, he had a lot more money than they had. Okay, so um, that's the name of the game is whoever has the most money wins. Um, and so Arkwright just, just plows through and, and, and keeps moving forward. Uh, and, and he is, uh, this is the next, uh, I mean, this maybe overshadows every other technological development that I've discussed up to this point, he invents the factory system. And this is where I, I was mentioning earlier is that we want to think of the way that you organize the workplace as a kind of technology, a kind of social engineering, the way that you split up the work process and the way that you hire people and fire people and the way that you discipline them and the way that you pay them and the way that you set up their lunch breaks and the way that you uh, make them uh, uh, behave and the, make the ways that you make them say things and all this is all a kind of social engineering that is a kind of technology. Um, and of course, this is a technology that we're very much dealing with today in 2021 with the sort of social engineering that Instagram and Facebook are doing, uh, you know, manipulating people's behavior and becoming incredibly wealthy by manipulating people's behavior. Arkwright is one of these social engineers and this is maybe his biggest uh, insight. <clears throat> so uh, in 1770, he opens a a cotton mill that's powered by horse, like the two horse system that he developed with K. Uh, and, but then shortly thereafter, he moves to Comford and creates a water powered mill along a river. It has this gigantic water well that's turning a crank and it's feeding into the mechanism, uh, maybe modified at this point that he and K developed 
and uh, and instead of uh, being called uh, the spinning frame, it's now called a water frame. And this becomes like the standard of the industry. So he has a single spool uh, spinning machine that's kind of industrial scale. You know, this isn't something you, you know, you're not setting up even one of these spindles in your living room and he has you know a hundred or maybe more spindles uh going on in what looks now like what we think of as a factory now we have a factory but this is like the first factory in england uh, there may be other other uh, operations that might make that claim but um but for our story, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, this is the first factory in England. The first factory. Uh, and so this is a very big development in conceiving of the Industrial Revolution. But what I want us to conceive it of as is the bourgeois Industrial Revolution because the bourgeois form of production that I described earlier, that is the technology. The social engineering is, is the key technology. The other stuff you know, is happening out there in terms of burger technology, but Arkwright sets it up as a factory. Okay, uh, it just takes it to the next level. So his water frame um, really upsets the industry. Um, this is producing higher quality uh, yarn. Um, maybe not higher quality in terms of the cottage industry producers from uh, using traditional techniques, but stronger from an industrial perspective so, so that we can uh, further on down the production process when you're actually weaving this stuff you're getting less breakage and and so you're getting more output okay so um and and that's the thing there's a there's a switch over so that uh, producing large quantities is a qualitative difference large quantities is better it's more beautiful uh, if you look at the individual threads, they may not be of the greatest quality, but because you can create such crazy large quantities of it, it's great, it's beautiful. Um, so, so that's a, a, a big conceptual shift that's taking place here. And Arkwright really needs to be credited with making a huge impact here because this has changed our society in so many ways. And the thing is, is the, the name of the game in bourgeois production is to de-skill the labor required. You don't want to have to train people as apprentices and take years to have them be journeymen apprentices. And, you know, you want to just bring in any barely warm body and put them into the process, pl plug and play, switch out components, and the people are, are part of the components. You, you don't want to deal with personalities. And that's what Arkwright really perfects here. Um, he does now, in the midst of this, patent a carding engine. Uh, now, the fact that he patents it doesn't mean that he invented it, um, as we've already seen. Uh, he's already suspected of stealing one patent, so he might have stole an invention, or maybe he bought it right outright uh, from somebody. But he does get his hands on a carding engine that um, that is effective, and, and so now uh, he opens up a second factory in Cromford uh, that is much larger. So the carding engine and this larger factory 
seem to go hand in hand. There seems to be a, a key connection there. And, uh, and now he's just off and running and he's working at a level way above everybody else. Highly profitable. Um, he has to bring in labor from other counties because there's just not enough people for him to hire into the factory, especially at the low wages that he's paying. You know, this is always one thing with when uh, capitalists cry about labor shortages. Um, there's only a labor shortage because they don't want to raise the wage. If you paid people enough money, you can get them to do almost anything. The only reason that people aren't coming in to, for your job is because you're not offering a high wage. You're offering a very low wage. That's what a labor short, shortage means, is that you're offering a very low wage that people are not interested in. Um, uh, but he has this so-called labor shortage uh, problem. So he's bringing in people from other counties uh, into his factory setting, setting them up in dormitory housing and doing two 13 hour shifts. And of course, a lot of this labor that's brought in is child labor. And we'll see this develop throughout the rest of the story. Um, and of course the workhouses that I mentioned before, um, they were a tremendous source of child labor. So this is a way that people that were on, on public assistance in the workhouse, um, well, they could send their child off to the factory and then they didn't have to worry about that mouth to feed. Um, and, and maybe this child would even send them some money or something like that, right? So uh, this is where child labor really um, starts to explode again because Arkwright is is driving down the wages and as he drives down the wages because he doesn't need people that are skilled he doesn't need people with attitude he doesn't need people that know how to or have great ideas he doesn't need people with great ideas he just needs somebody to do basic mechanical things kids are great for that okay so he opens up other mills in various locations. And so he's the first big industrial bourgeois capitalist, uh, at least in this story. I mean, we could find other stories that are, that are parallels, but, but I'm just using him as a model. And, you know, in England at this time, for all intents and purposes, he is the guy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. So let's, uh, let's, uh, stop there and then I'll start a new video.